Hello everybody, it's time for Friday Fromage from the Farm once again. I'm Kate Johnson from The Art of Cheese, located on Briargate Farm in Longmont, Colorado. And every Friday, or most Fridays, I bring you this little cheesy info session. So today we're going to talk about bloomies, beauties, and blues. If you know me, you know that I love alliteration. Friday fromage from the farm, Monday morning from the milk house, and now it's bloomies, beauties, and blues. So these are a few of the cheeses we're going to be talking about, and they are also part of the beauty contest. So if you've been following my Facebook this week, you saw that I posted 10 con contestants for my most beautiful cheeses of the year. And so people have been voting, and I'm going to tell you who the winners were in terms of the cheeses. And then I also um, said that I would draw one name and give you a free virtual class. So I will announce the name at the end today, and so I'll keep you in suspense until then. So let's just start out by what I'm talking about, bloomies and blues. Um, so the beauties part is the beauty contest, although these, some of these bloomies and blues are pretty beautiful, and in fact one of them was in the beauty contest. So if you're new to me, um, I do run a cheese making school here in Colorado, although right now I'm teaching pretty much all over the world because of the power of Zoom. Um, so I am in my classroom right now where I normally teach, but it's just been me in here for the past year or so, and so I've been reaching you all via Zoom. Thankfully, we have all that good technology. But at any rate, tomorrow I am teaching a class on two of the cheeses that we're going to talk about today. And I just thought it was good timing since I'm just about to teach this and I have um, at least one specimen that's really ready. And so the, I'm going to start by talking about the bloomies. And I'm going to show you two versions of the same cheese. So this is called Chaours, which is a French bloomy rind cheese. It's traditionally made with cow's milk, but the farm, Briargate Farm, is a goat farm. And so I did use goat milk for these because I had just a little bit of late season milk. But typically you would make these with cow's milk. Now I want to just show you these up close because these are the exact same cheese. What I did basically was I made one pot of milk and then I added the cultures and I did all the steps and then I put the curds into different sized containers. And you can see that they look really different, right? And so I thought it'd be a little bit fun just to talk about why do they look so different if they're exactly the same and why is this one all shrivelly and this one's more smooth? So in a bloomy rind cheese, and if you're not sure what I mean by that, think brie and camembert. Those are probably the most well-known bloomy rind cheeses. The bloom comes from a couple of things that we add, and we can add these things at different points in the cheese making, but typically um, it's things like penicillium candidum, that is a white mold powder, and sometimes that's all you're using is penicillium candidum. Or you might also be using something that's actually a yeast, but it's a yeast that behaves like a mold. And that's called ge geotrichum candidum. So you've got penicillium candidum, that is a mold. It, it, it grows a white moldy rind. So yes, that white rind on your brie and camembert is mold, but it's mold you put there on purpose. You want it to be there, it's very edible. And then geotrichum is a yeast, but it also grows kind of a bloomy rind. But when you see these little wrinklies, I kind of call this like the brain cheese. It looks like little, you know, parts of a brain. That is geotrichum at work. It does this really tight kind of gnarly little rind. And oftentimes you use them together because the geotrichum, it does have a flavor profile of its own, but it's also a very tight weave. And so it kind of adheres to the cheese better than just penicillium candidum alone. But you can see here that these two cheeses aged very differently, even though they are exactly the same. And that's just a great example of how sensitive these molds and yeasts are to their environment. And the main thing they're sensitive to is humidity, moisture. And the other thing is they grow at different rates. And you can kind of stop that growing by wrapping them. 
And so as it turns out, this one is a lot bigger than this one. And so this one um, was a bit drier. It took a little longer to get going. And so I left it a little bit longer before I wrapped it. And you can see that it's very smooth on the edge. There's a few ridges, but that was really the, the form, the basket that I had it in. And the rest of it's very smooth. So as I said earlier, this is a chawers, 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 <laughs> if you speak French, which I don't. At any rate, um, it's a bloomy rind cheese, much like many other cheeses. Sometimes these cheeses get a particular name because of where that cheese is from or originates. And this is from a little town in France called Chaurs. Um, but basically, it's very similar to other what we might call lactic set bloomy rind cheeses. But the difference in size made them age a little bit differently. And at a certain point, you decide you've got enough bloom, you've got what you want, and now you're going to wrap it. And you wrap it in this kind of two-ply paper. I've got a different cheese over here I'll take out just to show you. This is the best wrap for bloomy rinds. One side is waxy, the other side is clear, and if you can see this close up, it has tiny little holes, little perforations. And then there's a little kind of air pocket in between. So what this does is it allows your cheese to continue to age with air. It needs some air. If we suffocate it, it's just not going to do all of the ripening we want it to do while it's aging. But by putting this on your bloomy rind at a certain point, you sort of stop the rind development. Because otherwise, that bloomy rind just keeps on blooming, and it keeps growing, and it will take over your cheese, and you'll have a really thick rind, which some people like. Um, some people don't necessarily like the rind, but they like the cheese on the inside better when a, a big rind has developed. And that's because that rind is actually breaking down the interior of the cheese and making it all gelatinous and eventually liquid. Um, so, but at any rate, you can um, kind of halt the growing when you wrap it. So this one I decided was so pretty the way it looked right now. I actually just love the look of this cheese that I wrapped it a little sooner than this little guy. And so what happened basically was the Penicillium candidum, that's what makes the smoother bloom, it kind of took over the Geotrichum candidum. If I had let this one stay out at, at um, not out, it's in the aging refrigerator, but if I'd let it bloom a little longer, it too may have gotten a little more flat and uniform. And I just didn't let it because it actually has a partner in crime, another one about this size that's in the aging fridge that isn't quite so wrinkly. Um, so that's just a little bit about that bloomy rind. Now I'm going to shift to talking about blues, but I'm not completely leaving bloomy rinds because the next one I'm going to talk about is Cambazola. Now Cambazola is a crossover cheese, and those two words might sound kind of familiar, cam as in camembert and zola as in gorgonzola. So yes, Cambazola is a cross between a camembert style cheese, which is a very traditional French bloomy rind cheese, and gorgonzola, which is an Italian blue-veined blue cheese. Now, how do those blue veins get in there? We've already talked about how the bloomy rind gets on there. And, and incidentally, that bloomy rind, I forgot to mention this, could get put on there in a, a couple different ways. One way is that you could put that penicillium candidum, and if you decide to put the geotrichum candidum, you can put them right in the milk and then they will only grow where they're getting oxygen, which is on the outer edge. Another way you could do it is make your cheese without it, and then once you have a wheel of cheese, you could actually spray on a little mixture of water and that white mold powder and perhaps the little yeast powder as well, and then it'll grow on the outer edge. Now, I am just talking about traditional cheese making, or I shouldn't even say traditional, conventional cheese making, the way it's done in many, many parts of the U.S. and all over the world, which is where we're actually adding freeze-dried cultures back in. If you've heard me talk about this in other classes, there are ways to use more what are called wild cultures. Sometimes you're just using raw milk, which has a lot of these cultures in it naturally. You might be using clabber culture or kefir culture. And then a lot of these things, like penicillium candidum perhaps, 
and but definitely geotrichum candidum are going to be kind of naturally occurring. But I'm really not talking about that type of cheese making right now. I'm talking about where we've added these mold powders. And we could add them either to the milk or we could spray them on the rind at the end. Well, with a blue veined cheese, and this is a little piece of um, Cambazola, and this is one I actually just bought because the one I'm making isn't quite ready yet. The blue veins in this come from another mold. It's not a white mold, right? Because it's blue. It comes from Penicillium roqueforti, as in Roquefort, Roquefort or Gorgonzola. There isn't a Penicillium Gorgonzola. It's all Roqueforti. Um, and that is a blue mold that is what makes blue cheeses blue. It too needs oxygen. So in order to get it in the middle of your cheese, you actually have to pierce the cheese in order to get air into the center. Now with a cheese like Cambazola, that can be a little bit tricky because we're growing something on the rind that might make it hard for oxygen to get into the interior. So there's a couple of things we do when we're making a Cambazola that's a little bit different than other blue cheeses. Often with other blue cheeses, we're just putting those blue mold spores, again, into the milk. But in this case, I don't really want blue all over the outside of my cheese. I only really want it in the center. And so when I make Cambazola, I actually make the curds first, and then I sprinkle some just dry blue mold spores right into the center of the cheese. And then I can pierce it. Now, in this case, this is one I bought. This is called a black label um, Cambazola. And the interesting thing to me, if you can see it, the rind isn't bloomy like this rind, right? It's not white. It's got a bit of black in it. This is telling me that likely this cheesemaker used some ash along with the, the um, Penicillium candidum. And they've got this little bit of a black hue to it. But it is tricky because that bloomy rind grows and then it kind of seals things off. It's also very creamy. So to get air into the middle of this wheel can be tricky. So there are different ways to do that and there are different recipes and, and, and schools of thought. I have to be honest, I'm still experimenting a little bit with this myself. But I'll give you an example of one that I'm making right now. You can see it's got quite a bit of nice white bloom on the outside. The inside is this beautiful golden color. This is a cow milk version. But because I've already got so much rind, I pierced this cheese before the rind grew, but then the rind grew and my blue hasn't really bloomed yet, so I went ahead and pierced it again. I might pierce it once or twice more. It still has almost a month of aging to go. And so we, I cut a little piece open today just because I wanted to see. I don't know how much you can see it, but there's a few little spots that are starting to get blue. This one doesn't taste very blue yet. I would say this tastes like a camembert right now. But I have another version I made the same day out of goat milk. You can tell because it's very white on the inside. Goat milk isn't golden like good quality cow milk. It's much more white because goats can fully metabolize the beta carotene in their diet. And so they take out all that orange color. At any rate, this one also has gotten quite a bit of white mold. So I've pierced it again. And just like the other one, I'm not seeing much in terms of blue flecks yet, but I can taste them. So I cut this one open also. Let me see if I have a little piece here. There's a few little shadowy dark spots in the middle, and that's where I had put the blue mold that are just starting to develop. But when I taste this one, which is a little drier version than my cow milk one, my cow milk one, I added some cream to it to get it a little higher butter fat, and the goat milk one I didn't because this is late season goat milk. I raise Nubians, it's late season, and the milk is very high in butter fat right now. But this one is getting a little bit bluer a little bit sooner in terms of taste. So like I said, both of those still have almost a month to go in their aging. And I probably will, I have wrapped them lightly so that they can get a little more air into that center to get that nice blue veining. But um, I don't really want them to grow any more of their white mold. So it's a little tricky dance with these. There are some other ways, though, that we could also get that blue started a little faster. And I'm doing that right now. I should have gotten that cheese out. I didn't think of it. 
I'm doing that with another cheese right now called um, Blue Duqueras. Um, and that cheese has a significant period of time at the beginning of the aging where you leave it at a very warm temperature. Not quite room temperature, it's about 65 degrees instead of say 70 or 75. Luckily here in my cheese making classroom I can heat this separate from the rest of my house and so I just kept it at 65 for a week. So for a whole week that little wheel sat out with all kinds of little crevices because of how that cheese is made and it got quite blue before I ever put it into the cooler temperature to slow it down. So I think that one thing I might do with this um, little Cambazola the next time around to give it a little head start on getting that blue to start developing before my rind takes over, I think I'm going to give it a warm aging period for at least three or four days before I put it into the cheese fridge. This is the fun of home cheese making. You're constantly kind of tweaking your recipes based on the results you got and based on what you want. Um, and so it's, it's an art. That's why I call it the art of cheese and not the science of cheese. Yes, there is science, but if you don't learn how to kind of get creative and, and modify a little bit what you're doing, you won't have that much success. All right. Let's go to beauties now. So we talked about bloomies, we talked a little bit about blues, now we're gonna talk about the beauty contest. So again, um, if you didn't see it yet, just go to my post, the last post here, um, and I, I posted 10 pictures of, I thought, my 10 prettiest cheese photos from the year. And I labeled them one through 10, contestant number one through 10, and then I had you vote on them and tag some friends. And I promised that I would draw a name and that person would win a free cheese class. It's a virtual class because that's all we're doing right now. Before I draw the name or tell you who the name is, because I actually already know who it is, um, I want to tell you who the cheese winners were. So if you look at it, um, contestant number one and two were tied for first. Contestant number one was actually a little bloomy rind. It was a little bit bigger than this. I had sliced it, but it was really pretty because I, I took that picture just about exactly one year ago when I was in Hawaii, oh, that seems like a distant memory, doing a cheese making retreat. I actually did two cheese making retreats in Hawaii last year. I was supposed to be doing one right now this week, but it obviously got postponed. At any rate, I sliced this little wheel of, of brie, oh, it was a little bit bigger than this, and I had some pretty um, Hawaiian flowers and whatnot. So that one was tied with first place, and then my beautiful, it was a little prettier this in the picture, my um, tricolor cheddar was the other one that was tied for first place. In second place was this beauty, Chowers, which I am teaching tomorrow. I do think this is one of the prettiest little cheeses I've made. And that picture was very simple. It was just a colorful little plate with this beautiful cheese. The cheese did all the, the beauty. It didn't need flowers. And then in third place was a cheese that I no longer have because I ate it, <laughs> but I had the picture. It was called Livero. And that was a beautiful washed rind cheese with a wrap of several different um, bands on it. They were actually cattail, um, leaves that I wrapped it in. So those were first, second, and third. And so now I'm ready to tell you who won um, my drawing for the free class, and that person is here watching, and that's you, Joe. Joe Hyen is the winner today, yay! Yes, I think, Joe, you probably also picked those three. That's not why you won. <laughs> you won just because you tagged people and I picked your name, but you actually did pick those winners as well. So, congratulations, Joe. You, I'll reach out to you separately and tell you how to redeem your next free class. Joe has already taken a lot of classes from me, but maybe you want to come tomorrow. I don't know if you're signed up for that class or not. Anyhow, I'll get with you on that. All right. So, thank you all for watching today. Um, fun little um, Friday fromage from the farm. I used to do Monday morning from the milk house, which is where we go talk about goats. And I kind of suspended it over the winter when I really wasn't milking once and it's just a little too cold out there. But we start kidding in about two and a half weeks. And so I'm probably gonna start it up again, maybe a little later in the morning on Monday to give it a chance to warm up. 
but we have three goats that are going to be having kids within about 10 days of each other. So it seems like a good time to start that back up. So keep an eye out on things. We'll be, we will be doing Friday fromage from the farm at the same time, but we'll add in Monday morning from the milk house. All right. Thank you all so much for watching and eat some cheese now and have a great weekend. All right. I'll be in touch with you, Joe. Bye-bye.